From Creation Ministries International, you're listening to Creation.com's article podcast. The research and insights that give God the glory, refutes evolution, and gives you the answers to defend your faith. I'm Joseph Darnell. If you find yourself in conversation with a relatively well-educated Christian believer who has taken a compromise position on Genesis, believing in an old earth, evolution, etc., bringing up Genesis 1, 29-30 is always a good idea. These verses demonstrate very clearly that before the fall, God had only given plants for food to both humans and animals. This in turn refutes the vast majority of the compromised positions out there, since they mostly all seek to harmonize scripture with secular views on origins. However, as we are all likely aware, the secular view of origins cannot be parted from the idea of millions of years of death and suffering, including carnivory, prior to the emergence of human beings. Genesis 1 29-30 tells us, And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruits. You shall have them for food, and to every beast on the earth, and to every bird of the heavens, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. I have found with surprising regularity one simple response to the above from the compromised crowd. They say, These passages don't say anything about disallowing meat. And that is a true but highly misleading statement, which succeeds only in ignoring the obvious intent of the passage. A simple parable can perhaps elucidate this. Imagine you were welcoming a guest couple into your home for a short stay. You take them to the kitchen and open a cupboard and say, you can eat any of the canned goods here in the cupboard while you're here. What have you effectively done? You have allowed the eating of canned goods while disallowing all the other foods in the cupboard without explicitly mentioning them. So, if you return home to find your guests have eaten all of the cereal and candy bars, you will likely confront them. If they retort, Well, you didn't say that we couldn't have this stuff. You will undoubtedly not be impressed with their sarcastic and insincere response. Amazingly, this is exactly the type of response most old earthers will provide when confronted with this passage of scripture. This alone would, or should, be enough. However, we have more than this to confirm this interpretation. Let's briefly return to our parable. Imagine that your grocery situation changes over a few days, and you bring your guests back to the cupboard a second time. Now you say, just as before I gave you the canned goods, now you can have anything in the cupboard. Would this not remove any smidgen of doubt about the intent behind your first statement to disallow certain items? It turns out, God made a statement corresponding to this in Genesis 9, following the flood. Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. And as I gave you the green plants, I give you everything, but you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood. If, as the compromisers like to say, God didn't disallow meat in Genesis 1, then why was it necessary for God to issue this allowance here? Why does God say, as I gave you the green plants, I give you everything? The old earth view here entails that everything was already allowed from the beginning. The next time you discuss this topic with an old earther or theistic evolutionist, try out this helpful parable to explain the relevance of Genesis 1 29 through 39 and chapter 9 verses 3 through 4 on the topic of prefall death and carnivory. Hey listener, while you're studying the early chapters of Genesis, have you felt like you're not learning as much as you might if you had a written commentary? As amazing and meaningful as the book of Genesis is, I want to learn everything that I can from the theology and history that started, well, everything in life. But as many of the details of the book of Genesis relate to science, it would be great if it was also a scientific commentary. That's why I recommend that you get a copy of a great book by Dr. Jonathan Sarfati, The Genesis Account. This classic commentary on Genesis 1 through 11 contains a thorough analysis of the text itself and has a number of features that set it apart from many other Genesis commentaries. 
It defends the biblical creationist position, creation in six consecutive normal days, death resulting from Adam's fall, and a globe-covering flood, and confusion of languages at Babel, and in the process, it explains how the rest of the Bible interprets Genesis in a straightforward manner. While skillfully documenting how interpreters throughout church history have taught the topics of the book of Genesis, and that long-age death before sin views were a reaction to 19th century uniformitarian geology, it also provides cutting-edge scientific support for Genesis history. But most importantly, it demonstrates that all doctrines of Christianity begin in Genesis 1 through 11, so straightforwardly answers the commonest objections to a plain understanding of these crucial Genesis texts. You'll find your copy of the Genesis account at creation.com slash store. The creation.com article podcast is hosted by me, Joseph Darnell, and produced out of the U.S. studio of Creation Ministries International. Learn more at creation.com. This episode article was written by Paul Price. Our writers and scientists host a really cool talk show called creation.com talk, which you can find right here in your podcast app and YouTube. If you'd like to help us, become a monthly supporter using our donate page, or simply text a donation to 84321. You can also help out by telling your friends and family to check out our podcasts and creation.com. Be sure to follow Creation Ministries International on Facebook and Instagram, and subscribe to our free e-newsletter, InfoBytes. From everyone at CMI, thanks for listening. <laughs>